Um, so welcome everyone to today's Learning with FASD webinar. Um, today we are going to be looking at the referral assessment and diagnostic process for FASD, um, an overview specifically tailored for educators. So before um, I begin today, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, water and culture. Um, I'm currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation today, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I would also like to pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, people who might be joining us today. And if you would like to, feel free to pop in the chat um, on what land you're joining us from today as well. So I'm going to start the session with a little bit of housekeeping. So as participants at this webinar, you are in what's called listen only mode. So that means that we cannot see or hear you. Um, the webinar is being recorded and it, the session will be made available to you along with some slide handouts after the webinar. Um, it will also be available on the Matilda Center YouTube channel in the coming days. And if you have registered, which you obviously have because you're here, then you'll also get the email link to it as well. Um, at the end of today's session, we will have a question and answer session. Um, so please feel free to, as we go throughout the webinar today, pop your questions into the Q&A box that should be down at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you can't find it, feel free to reach out in the chat. And we've got the lovely and wonderful Julia helping us behind the scenes today. So just a quick little overview, if you do happen to be new to Learning with FASD before we get started today. Um, my name is Emma Devine and I'm the project manager for Learning with FASD. And what Learning with FASD is, how many times can you say Learning with FASD in one sentence? Um, it's a project that is developed as a collaboration between the Matilda Centre, um, Australian educators and also leading experts in the space. The project was funded by the Australian Government Department of Health and Aged Care. And what it does is provides a centralized access point for evidence-based resources that assist primary teaching and support staff to understand and to better support children with FASD. On the website at the moment, we've got 25 evidence-based resources. Um, some have been developed by the research team here at Matilda, and some have been developed um, by high quality you know, external teams as well. And the types of resources on the website do span a whole range. So they include things like fact sheets, guides, videos and quizzes as well to test your knowledge and um, we focus in on some key topic areas so there's sort of an overview of you know what is FASD and just understanding that classroom strategies and family engagement as well and then we do run these webinar series quarterly so like the one today and send out quarterly e-newsletters e with updates resources and other information um, so I think Julie is going to pop links to those in the chat if you would like to know more as well. But without further ado, we will get moving on today's webinar. So today we are joined by Kelly Jang, who's a clinical neuropsychologist, Lucy Fleming, a senior speech pathologist, and Diana Barnett, a senior occupational therapist, who all work at the Cicada Centre in New South Wales, which is based at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. So the Cicada Centre brings together three teams of experts spanning fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, family services, and the Adolescent Drug and Alcohol Service, all with the aim of assisting children, adolescents, and families. The services use a trauma-informed and culturally appropriate assessment process to deliver diagnoses and recommendations for children and adolescents, so from that zero to 17 age mark. Um, and without further ado, I will hand over to the team. Okay, we'll just get our screen sharing sorted. And we will share. No. Is that working for everybody? Yeah, perfect. That's in presenter mode and everything. So I think you're good to go. Excellent. So hello and thank you for joining us for our webinar today, providing an overview of the referral assessment and diagnostic process of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, FASD for educators. My name is Lucy Fleming. I'm a speech pathologist and my colleagues, Kelly Jang, clinical neuropsychologist and Diana Barnett, occupational therapist, will also be presenting today. 
We work on the Cicada FASD team at Children's Hospital Westmead, providing a New South Wales statewide service for the assessment and diagnosis of children who have been exposed to prenatal um, alcohol consumption and who present with neurodevelopmental difficulties. I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the land I'm joining you from today, the land of the Darug people who have loved and cared for this land for thousands of years. I would like to extend this acknowledgement to the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all joining from, and further to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us in the webinar today. We pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connection to land. So today we hope to cover the following areas, introducing FASD and how it is described in the literature. We talk about the 10 neurodevelopmental domains of impairment and how a child's profile can vary depending on what their strengths and areas of severe impairment are. We look at the functional impact of difficulties in developmental areas and how these needs may present in the child at school. Primary school educators and support staff play a vital role in creating awareness of and identifying a child's strengths and difficulties in the school setting. You are in a unique position where you get to observe a child's capacity and performance across different activities, including in the classroom, in the playground, during large group and small group settings and have a valuable role to play in providing information about a child's functioning. We look at what steps you can take if you have concerns regarding a child's progress. With the right support and early intervention, good outcomes across a range of life goals are more likely to be achieved for people with FASD. Effective collaboration between the family, health professionals, the school and service providers ensures best opportunities for children at risk of or diagnosed with FASD. So the idea that alcohol was associated with impaired growth and neurological anomalies dates back to the early 1700s. It was only in 1973 in a paper published in the British medical journal, The Lancet, that two Seattle physicians, Jones and Smith, coined the term fetal alcohol syndrome, describing a pattern of anomalies occurring in children born to alcoholic women. These features were pre and or postnatal growth retardation, characteristic facial abnormalities and central nervous system dysfunction, including mental impairment or intellectual disability. The Australian Guide to the Diagnosis of FASD was published in Australia in 2016. These guidelines recognize the importance of neurodevelopmental impairment as core to this condition, rather than the physical and facial features. FASD is a preventable, lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder caused by prenatal alcohol exposure, or PAE. It is a form of acquired brain injury where the insult to the brain has occurred prenatally as a result of exposure to alcohol, a known teratogen, meaning that it can disrupt the normal development of an embryo or fetus. Global estimates indicate there could be up to 630,000 children per year born meeting criteria for FASD. It is recognized that rates of FASD are higher in specific populations, including in the correctional population, where it can be 30.3 times higher than the normal population. Higher in people of low socioeconomic status, higher in populations of people seeking psychiatric care, prevalence of FASD also higher in Aboriginal populations and in children in out-of-home care. The Cicada FASD team have recognized and responded to the need for improved assessment and diagnostic pathways for these populations by forging stronger links with specific agencies working with these patient groups and families across settings. 
a 2016 study of a population-based cohort of 1,570 women attending public hospital antenatal clinics in Melbourne found that 41.3% of expectant women did not drink, 27% drank only in the first trimester, and 87% of those stopped when they realized they were pregnant. 27% continued to drink, 50% of those at a low or moderate level, and 18.5% binge drank prior to pregnancy recognition. So women whose age at first intoxication was less than 18 years, the legal drinking age in Australia, were significantly more likely to drink in pregnancy and at binge levels prior to pregnancy recognition. When compared with abstainers and to women who drank solely in trimester one, those who drank throughout pregnancy tended to be in their early to mid thirties. They tended to smoke, have a higher income, and educational attainment. This study demonstrates that alcohol consumption during pregnancy is not just a problem for low socioeconomic populations. This study is also replicated in other, excuse me, this information is also replicated in other Australian studies, which have found that higher income and tertiary educated women were two to four times more likely to drink alcohol throughout pregnancy than women with only secondary school education. As noted, we need evidence of prenatal alcohol exposure, PAE, to accept a child's referral to our service for assessment and consideration of a diagnosis of FASD. So what does our clinic consider as evidence of prenatal alcohol exposure? It can be a statement directly from the child's birth mother However, about 80% of children that we see in our clinic here are in out of home care, and this is not often possible to get. We also accept a signed witness statement from someone who directly witnessed the birth mother consume alcohol during the pregnancy. So this could be a family or a community member. Otherwise, we can request records from DCJ under section 16A of the Children and Young Persons Act 1998, as this information is important to complete an accurate assessment of the child. Antenatal, birth or medical records are another source of potential information regarding PAE. This highlights the importance of accurate documentation completed and maintained by healthcare and other professionals. To conduct a comprehensive assessment, we also have to look at other contributing causes to neurodevelopment and pre and postnatal exposures. This information is considered in the diagnostic formulation and added to our summary form and reports. Confidential and sensitive information can be withheld on some reports to stakeholders, dependent on the wishes of the parents or carers. So we ask about pregnancy complications, infections, whether there were any substances used during pregnancy, such as cigarettes, opiates, amphetamines, or prescribed drugs such as anticonvulsants or ibuprofen. Studies have shown that smoking and prenatal alcohol exposure may interact synergistically to increase the risk of FASD related outcomes, including low birth weight. During assessment, we also talk and ask about psychosocial issues, such as domestic or family violence, mental health difficulties, homelessness, and information on any other adverse childhood experiences or ACEs that the child may have had in their lifetime. The Australian Guide to the Diagnosis of FASD was designed to assist clinicians in the diagnosis, referral, and management of FASD. It is a tool that we reference regularly in our everyday practice here in the clinic. The guide states FASD can be diagnosed with or without the presence of sentinel facial features, so long as there is confirmed PAE, or prenatal alcohol exposure, and sufficient, or at least three areas of severe neurodevelopmental impairment. 
the two main categories, as we can see here on the screen, of FASD diagnosis are FASD with three sentinel facial features and FASD with less than three sentinel facial features. When prenatal alcohol exposure is unknown, the only way a diagnosis is possible is when all three sentinel facial features are present. This is because when all three facial features are present, we can assume with a high degree of certainty that the child was exposed to alcohol prenatally. Let's look at the sentinel facial features. So fecal exposure to alcohol during the first trimester can affect the development of facial features. The areas most affected are the orbital region around the eyes and the mid face. There are three sentinel facial features that we sometimes see in children who've been exposed to alcohol during pregnancy. These are a short palpable fissure length. That is the distance between the inner and outer points of the eye documented in the child's photograph between points A and B. The length is considered to meet sentinel facial feature criteria if it is more than two standard deviations below the mean for the child's age and ethnicity group. The second sentinel facial feature is a smooth filtrum. So this is the space between the nose and the lip. And the third is a thin upper lip. We also see these sentinel facial features illustrated in the photograph with the child displaying a smooth flat philtrum and thin upper lip. Both the philtrum and upper lip receive a grade of one to five. So this is done both visually and for the upper lip through volumetric analysis with ranks four and five considered diagnostic range and one, two and three being normal. We use measurement and normative data to assess the facial dysmorphology. There are normative data for Caucasians and African American populations. Only 17, excuse me, only 17% of individuals affected by FASD have distinct facial features. This slide shows the 10 domains of neurodevelopment as defined in the guide. Patterns of neurodevelopmental impairment in individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure are complex and diverse. There is no typical pattern of impairment in FASD, most likely due to differences in the timing and level of PAE and genetic and environmental factors that influence maternal blood alcohol level and brain development. For a diagnosis of FASD to be made, there needs to be at least three neurodevelopmental domains of severe impairment. The diagnosis of FASD does not necessarily require assessment of all these domains featured on this slide. Assessment should be prioritized according to the individual's functional difficulties, age and capacity for testing, and given local resources. We recommend that adaptive function is assessed in all individuals. And this looks at the child's adaptive behavior, social skills, and social communication. Even when three domains are found to be impaired, testing of other domains is encouraged where there are clinical concerns. This will assist clinicians to fully identify the individual strengths and needs to develop appropriate recommendations for management, referral, and intervention. When these needs are adequately addressed, the likelihood of seeing gains across the child's adaptive behavior and overall functional ability is increased. Particularly in younger children, not all domains can be assessed. In this case, where there is confirmed prenatal alcohol exposure, the initial assessment when the child is of a young age may conclude at risk of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and the child will require follow-up and reassessment. So now we are looking at the scoring of assessments. So a child's performance on neurodevelopmental domain testing is categorized according to whether they present with no, some, or severe impairment in that domain on assessment. We use percentile ranks in our scoring and consideration of performance. 
Severe impairment is noted and a child is deemed to fulfill criteria for severity in a domain if they score two or more standard deviations below the mean or are at or below the third percentile. This means that in a group of 100 same age children, the child's performance is equal to or better than three other children. This category of performance is highlighted on the bell curve on this visual. Severe impairment can also be considered with clinical judgment if there is a significant discrepancy between composite scores or areas of testing in that domain. Now we're looking at the first domain that we had featured on the 10 domain side, and that is brain structure and neurology. This domain is assessed and considered by the pediatrician on the team. A head circumference measurement is recorded for all children coming through our clinic. Structural brain abnormalities known to be associated with PAE shown on brain imaging include a small head circumference, less than the third centile or greater than two standard deviations below the mean. So we refer to this as microcephaly. Um, also structural brain abnormalities. A child would fulfill criteria for severe impairment in this domain if they present with a seizure disorder, not due to known postnatal causes or if the child shows significant neurological diagnosis, otherwise unexplained. So say for example, cerebral palsy. Now we're moving on to the domain of language. So language ability is often divided into two main areas, receptive and expressive language. Receptive language refers to the ability to understand and process information such as vocabulary, stories, instructions, and questions. So you may say you may see difficulties in um, a child in your class um, with receptive language impairment if they show some of the following areas. So difficulty following the directions. The child in the class may be able to repeat directions back to you, but has trouble understanding what to do and following through with what they've been asked. They may show difficulty with understanding concepts such as before and after, first, next, last, and following these sequenced concepts during tasks. They may have difficulty understanding, learning new vocabulary, and making links with vocabulary that they already know. You may recognize that a child needs a lot of additional teaching and exposure to vocabulary. Maybe you've spent time teaching more complex vocabulary and synonyms, yet the child always reverts back to using the most simple version of the word. Example, using the word happy as opposed to cheerful or delighted. When we talk about expressive language, we talk about the ability to use language to communicate information using vocabulary, grammar, and adequate sentence structure. So you may notice some children in your class presenting with expressive language difficulties as follows. Difficulties finding words to describe their actions. Difficulties structuring language to share a coherent personal narrative, such as what they got up to on the weekend, an experience that they had on holidays, or maybe what happened when they were sick. They may have trouble explaining to others how to play a game communicating and expressing themselves in the playground, including convincing or persuading peers to join an activity or to be on their team. So this slide shows some typical areas that we usually feature on our communication assessment. So we look at receptive language, and this is a measure of the students listening and auditory comprehension skills, expressive language, as previously noted, refers to the ability to use the correct words, grammar, and syntax to communicate thoughts and ideas. We look at the child's core language, which is equivalent to their everyday language skills. We might also capture their language content ability. And this is a measure of the quality of language that they use and understand during their daily interactions. We may also look at the child's language memory, and this measures memory-dependent language ability. Informally, 
we have started to look at school-aged children's narrative ability. So these skills directly relate to the linguistic demands expected for them at school as an essential part of the New South Wales curriculum in all learning areas. It closely relates to functional language ability. Um, for example, how do the child's difficulties in expressive language impact upon their ability to share personal experiences, describe a movie that they watched with a friend, to reject an idea or item, to protest against something that they don't want, or to express a range of feelings. It's important to note that children can have an uneven language profile. So we often see here in clinic that a child may be able to use language and express themselves broadly within the expected age range. However, their understanding of language can be severely impaired. And this emphasizes the importance of ensuring a comprehensive language assessment is completed with all areas taken into account. And further considerations for a language assessment. It's important for children to acquire a hearing assessment. Um, we know that hearing loss is common in children at risk of or with a diagnosis, potential diagnosis of FASD. Uh, for children who present as bilingual or multilingual and they speak English as a second language, they should have access to an assessment in their home language or an English language assessment that is supported by an interpreter. Okay. Um, so... So now I'll be speaking about um, some domains relevant to a psychologist, so what domains an a psychologist can assess. So firstly, cognition. Um, cognition in the Australian Guide to FASD refers to an individual's intellectual functioning. So that is their ability to think logically, reason and think abstractly, comprehend ideas and solve problems. Intellectual functions can be broadly categorised as those that relate to verbal intellectual abilities, visual spatial processing, fluid reasoning and speed of information processing. If working memory is the only domain of difficulty, it's then considered under the executive function domain for the purposes of a FASD assessment. Cognition is a crucial neurodevelopmental domain to assess when a child presents with any kind of neurodevelopmental challenge including the possibility of FASD, as it provides an understanding of where that individual child's general developmental level is. And it's against this background that we can then understand if other areas of their neurodevelopment are in keeping with their general development or a further area of concern. A student with impairments in intellectual functioning may experience difficulty learning new ideas or acquiring new skills difficulty understanding concepts, difficulty processing information as fast as others their age, and they may struggle in school and require additional support for their learning. In some children or young people with impaired overall intellectual abilities, there may be flow and effects of poor intellectual functioning to difficulties in their day-to-day -day living skills, which I'll talk more about in the adaptive behaviour domain. But this is when consideration is given to the diagnosis of intellectual disability. When intelligence is in all areas is extremely low on a standardised intelligence test and when there are significant impairments in day-to-day -day living skills. Most children with FASD do not have an intellectual disability, though there may be some weaknesses in specific areas of their intellectual profile. The next domain I'll speak about is academic achievement. So this is one domain in which teachers are exceptionally well-placed to identify difficulties in. Academic achievement refers to the extent to which a student is performing at or meeting age or grade expectations in a specific area of study. Learning difficulties can affect any one of a number of areas of academic achievement, such as reading on an individual word level, reading comprehension, maths, spelling, or written expression. Signs of an individual with difficulties in academic achievement include poor performance at school and in external tests compared to other children, even if IQ is normal, not achieving at the same level of other children. They may have specific learning problems, e.g. with maths, they may not understand abstract concepts, 
They may not understand the concept and value of money. There could be signs of anxiety, task refusal, disengagement from school. So sometimes persistent academic difficulties that are left unaddressed can result in school refusal or other behavioural challenges. When assessing whether or not a child meets criteria for severe impairment in academic achievement, it is important to consider that individual's intellectual capacity. Are they achieving academically at the level we would expect given their intelligence, or is their achievement below expectations for their year level and intellectual ability? Other important factors would include whether the child has had adequate school attendance or received appropriate instruction. So some of the children we see have had very disrupted school, school attendance histories and as a result of multiple placement, as a result of multiple placement changes over a short period of time. For some children with unmanaged ADHD, we need to be confident that their attention or behavioural challenges are not the main issue interfering with their academic progress before saying that they have severe impairment in this domain. The next domain is attention. So despite attention being a term that we frequently use in our day-to-day -day conversations, it can actually be a little bit tricky to define it because there are different types of attention. So selective attention is the ability to focus on specific information while ignoring extraneous information. Divided attention is the ability to focus on two or more things at the same time. Alternating attention or attention switching is the ability to transfer focus from one activity to another. And sustained attention is the ability to concentrate over a period of time. So students with difficulties in attention may demonstrate symptoms such as um, having difficulty paying attention in tasks or play activities. They may not seem to listen when they're spoken to directly. They may have poor persistence in activities and difficulty staying on task independently. So they may fail to follow through on instructions and fail to finish work. They may have difficulty attending to two or more pieces of information at the same time. They may fail to give close attention to details or make careless mistakes in their work. And they may be easily distracted by extraneous stimuli. Attention can be assessed through a combination of methods, including standardised questionnaires, qualitative observations, and performance-based testing. It is most commonly assessed indirectly through informant questionnaire. So that is asking people around the individual being assessed, very importantly, classroom teachers, to complete questionnaires to report on symptoms of attention and attention-related behaviours such as hyperactivity and impulsivity. So best practice would use standardised questionnaires that compare a student's level of symptomatology to those of a similar age in the normative population. Teachers are often even better placed than carers to comment on a child's attention skills because the demands and expectations of the school environment are very different to the environments that parents and carers observe children in. So when you receive a request for a teacher questionnaire to be completed, Understand that it is because your observations of the student in the classroom are invaluable to our assessment. So qualitative observations can be taken as to how the child or young person behaves in a particular environment. For example, could be during a classroom lesson or during cognitive testing. Um, and performance-based measures are also available to um, specific psychologists who may be trained in using them. However, just because we may see a child's attention functioning is normal in the clinic setting, we've realised this is a really artificial environment with minimal distractions, no competing demands and one-to-one -one support. This is why your documentation of observations and the child's functioning in the school environment is critical to assessments. And this is why we encourage you to share your observations in the form of a letter or conversation with clinicians. So if an individual meets criteria for ADHD in attentive presentation or combined presentation, this is considered as meeting criteria for severe impairment in the attention domain, according to the FASD guide. And ADHD is one of the most commonly reported mental health diagnoses in individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure. And the proportion of children with FASD, with FASD diagnosed 
with ADHD increases with the level of alcohol exposure the child is exposed to. So memory is the next domain and refers to the process of laying down new information into mind, retaining that information over time and retrieving it or bringing it back to mind at some point in time in the future. Individuals with memory impairments may have difficulties at any stage in the memory process. So encoding new information, that is taking new information in, keeping that information in their memory over a period of time, that's memory storage or retention, or recalling and accessing the memory after a delay. In the classroom, this may result in functional difficulties such as inability to learn the name of a new student, forgetting to bring complete assignments in on the due date, or difficulty remembering the content of lessons from one day to the next. Memory is dependent on a number of other cognitive processes, such as attention and concentration, information processing speed, organizational strategies, effort, and self-monitoring skills. So sometimes poor memory performance may be attributable to other impaired cognitive factors. Executive function refers to a range of high level thinking skills in planning and organization of a person's thoughts and behaviors to achieve the desired goal efficiently. For the purposes of FASD diagnostic criteria, this domain includes impulse control and response inhibition, hyperactivity, working memory, planning and problem solving, shifting and cognitive flexibility. So what are the common difficulties that impairments in this domain can cause? It can cause difficulty organizing oneself for the day and making plans, but not knowing where to start. Difficulty coming up with new ways to solve problems. Difficulty thinking through the consequences of an action before taking the action and difficulty stopping an automatic response. The next domain is affect regulation. And affect regulation in the current Australian Guide to the Diagnosis of FASD refers to diagnosed mood and anxiety disorders. So common difficulties may include persistently low mood, the inability to feel pleasure through previously enjoyable activities, um, agitation, excessive worry and rumination. So the assessment of this domain requires a clinical assessment through comprehensive history taking and clinical interview. So direct assessment is not possible. Then standardized questionnaires can be used to assist a diagnosis, but should not be used solely to determine whether this domain is considered severely impaired. The next domain is adaptive behavior, social skills and social communication. So adaptive behavior ref refers to the life skills which enable an individual to live independently in a safe and competent matter, manner and how well they cope with everyday tasks. Social communication refers to how and why we use language, verbal and nonverbal, to interact and communicate with other people. So thinking about adaptive behavior, deficits in this area would result in an individual requiring more help to support and support to meet the demands of their day-to-day -day life. For a young child, this would mean their parents are required to do more in terms of feeding, dressing and toileting their child. Or for an older child, it could mean the parent has to frequently prompt or remind the young person to engage in activities such as grooming and other self-care or organizational tasks. Deficits in social communication can result in difficulties participating in social activities, difficulties developing peer and romantic relationships um, and performing successfully socially at school. Adaptive behaviour is assessed observationally through carer and or teacher report on standardised questionnaires, such as the Violent Adaptive Behaviour Scales or Adaptive Behaviour Assessment System, whereas social communication is assessed through clinical history, qualitative observations, informant questionnaires, and through direct semi-structured assessment using autism specific tools such as the ADOS. So when considering social communication as part of this domain in a FASD assessment, we're looking at whether the individual meets criteria for social communication disorder or autism spectrum disorder. One message we don't want to perpetuate is the idea that a FASD assessment can only be conducted by a specialist multidisciplinary team. We're very lucky to be part of a specialist MDT at Cicada here, 
but we also recognise that our situation is very unique and the breadth of need to assess, diagnose and support extends well beyond our capacity as a team. So we want to empower the community, including education professionals, health clinicians and paediatricians, as well as the general public, to understand that we all have an important role in prevention, recognition and initiating the process to gain help and contributing to the assessment and management of children with FASD. So members of the school community can be so helpful in recognising signs of and facilitating FASD assessment and supporting children with FASD. Key members to be involved in this process would include the executive in terms of providing support in in terms of um, supporting the information sharing required and resource allocation, classroom teachers and the learning and support team who are the eyes and ears and involved in formulating and providing learning and behaviour support when needed and the school counselling service. So from an assessment perspective, school counsellors or school psychologists complete, can complete a number of assessments with children that provide invaluable information about a child's functioning. They have the benefit of being able to assess a child in an environment which is more familiar to the child and therefore may be more conducive to demonstrating their abilities. They can also conduct assessments over several sessions to ensure the tests are tapping what they're intending to measure rather than measuring fatigue. So I've listed a few of the more common tests that can be conducted by school counsellors or psychologists. Key domains that can be addressed include cognition, that's intellectual functioning, academic achievement, School counsellors can also help coordinate classroom teacher completion of questionnaires, investigating attention, adaptive behaviour and other emotional and behavioural screening tools. And I also wanted to stress the value of qualitative information from the school. Often even more helpful than ratings on a rating scale, qualitative information um, can be communicated in a letter, in a telephone discussion or through responses on open-ended questions and questionnaires. So please document what your concerns are, if there are any, not just learning, but also social, emotional and behavioural concerns. Describe their behaviours, what strategies or supports have been trialled and how the child has responded. Um, and you can also make a note on the engagement from carers and other services that are involved. I'll pass over now to Diana. So the final domain that we haven't looked at yet is the motor skills domain. So motor skills relate to balance, movement and coordination of the large and small muscles of the body. Motor skills are assessed using a range of standardised assessment tools as well as through clinical observation. As well as the use of standardised tools, assessment includes looking at the quality of movement and whether this can be sustained over a period of time long enough to complete the task at hand. For younger children, developmental assessments may include a motor component and therefore also provide information about this domain. However, a specific motor assessment provides more detailed information. Common concerns that arise from difficulties or challenges with motor skills can be grouped into a number of areas. This includes challenges with fine motor skills, which may result in poor dexterity and difficulty manipulating objects such as lunch boxes, shoelaces, cutlery, or scissors. In order for a task to be completed, specific training, adaption, or more time may be required. Challenges with gross motor skills may include general clumsiness, poor balance, poor motor skill, poor ball skills, and decreased strength. This can lead to isolation from peers if unable to engage in playground or sport activities with associated poor self-esteem and health issues. Students may benefit from support around postural control, such as seating in the class, short breaks, and close playground supervision. The ideal grip for holding a pencil requires, a, requires finger dexterity and Alternate grips may result in pain and decreased legibility. The guidance of a therapist may be required to develop these skills, incorporating specific hand strength activities. Students may benefit from extra time and minimising writing, such as um, copying from the board, perhaps providing a hard copy or using a scribe 
as well as using technological solutions such as word processing and predictive word texts. These handwriting samples demonstrate how challenges with graphomotor skills can result in handwriting being difficult to read due to poor letter formation or poor placement of words on the line and therefore limiting the young person's ability to um, demonstrate their knowledge and their abilities. As part of my assessment, I will frequently ask a young person and their carers and even call schools or ask to ask teachers for further information about functional handwriting skills within the classroom. Immature drawing skills may be an indication of visual motor difficulties and potential issues with handwriting. All this information is used to assess the presence and level of any motor skill challenges. Depending on which of the 10 neurodevelopmental domains have been most affected, patterns of strengths and weaknesses across young people presenting with FASD can vary considerably. This diagram gives an illustration of a relative, um, relative stages of development for a teenager with FASD. For example, a young person whose actual age is 18 years may appear better than you might expect in terms of their expressive language, whereas comprehension, social maturity, functional math skills like money management and social skills might be that of a much younger child. Abilities and skills can be very mixed. So why, why diagnose? What is the benefit of looking at um, into this diagnosis? We have found that parents and caregivers have overwhelmingly described that having a diagnosis for the young person in their care has helped them better understand the causes of the child's problems and helps to develop realistic expectations of their capabilities. It can also assist the young person understand themselves better, particularly their strengths, weaknesses, and why they may respond as they do in certain situations. This information is also likely to assist smoother, realistic planning of the future transition into adulthood. With better understanding of any challenges, targeted functional support can be implemented. This may include early intervention, classroom support, therapy intervention or behavioural support. Understanding the issues at hand can also enable appropriate supports to be put in place for the birth mother which can lead to the prevention of this issue reoccurring in future pregnancies. And on a public health level, being able to count the problem makes it more visible to health professionals and the general public, which increases the public awareness of the risk of harm from prenatal alcohol exposure. The ultimate goal is better health care and better social outcomes. If concerned, Educators should voice their concerns and strongly recommend that the child they're concerned about access a paediatrician assessment. Describe what you see to carers and clearly document all educational and social concerns about the child. This will assist all health professionals better understand the issues. Identifying what may be triggers for the child as well as what strategies have been used and tried and the outcomes of implementing those strategies is also really helpful to health professionals. School counsellors can complete and initiate assessments such as cognitive, academic, memory and behaviour rating scales. This image is from the Learning with FASD website and is a perfect resource for support around what to do if you are concerned. The resource explores the roles and interplay between primary school teachers, support staff and the medical and allied health professionals. When providing support and managing the challenges, it is important to focus on the child's interests and strengths, which may include visual skills and creative skills, pitch the learning to the right level, use clear, simple instructions and include visual and auditory cues, allow time for lots of repetition and modelling, allow time for breaking the tasks into small steps, recognising the complex task is more difficult to complete if um, several domains of neurodevelopmental functioning are required and perhaps looking at what the different components of one task are and breaking it into small steps. 
provide hands-on learning, create a structured and predictable environment, access funding supports, and improving self-monitoring with the use of devices such as mobile phone calendars and reminders for the young person. Using the eight magic keys to underpin teaching and learning strategy, encourage the use of concrete and simplified language, being consistent, using lots of repetition, keeping a routine and providing a structure to each school day. Another key strategy is reframing behaviour. It is easy to misinterpret challenges and um, as a student perhaps being willful or egocentric or lacking in empathy and perhaps this kind of model can assist in managing the circumstances. Avoid the use of consequences and these are often misunderstood in these circumstances also. The West Australian Education has additional information about supporting students with FASD and the the first resource on this slide is um, one that has been developed by them and has lots of helpful information. The NoFASD website also has other resources such as this book, Try Different Rather Than Harder. Additional resources which may well be helpful include Through Different Eyes, which is a 24 page booklet providing information to early childhood educators about FASD. There is also the 584 Karma Classrooms resource and there are also a range of um, videos and learning um, opportunities, fact sheets through the Learning with FASD website. Both these websites are the go-to websites for FASD information in Australia. So that is the No FASD website, which also has a parent helpline, as well as the FASD hub. Throughout Australia, there are different services um, who undertake, are able to provide FASD assessments and recommendations for intervention. These are the major services um, in each state. Each service may have different referral criteria and see different ages. So that will be something that you will need to look into yourself when you're wanting to make that referral. But contacting these services will provide you with some information. Our FASD service, the FASD service in New South Wales, will have an in-person training event in May, which will be a one-day event where we will cover a lot of the information that we have touched on today in more detail, including some case studies. So if anyone is interested, please contact our service and we can provide more information about that. And finally, these are our contact details and the slides will also have some references for your use later on. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kelly, Lucy and Diane. That was so helpful. It really struck me, you know, how detailed it all is and how complicated a diagnosis is and, and the amount of work that you and your team do to, to help support children in this space. So thank you so much for today's webinar. We do have a couple of minutes to touch on a couple of questions. Um, so on the slide that you can see there, you can see where the Q&A box is. If you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in there. Um, we do have one question to get us started, if you're ready and willing. Um, so it's a question sort of building on what you were talking about in, in terms of the, the benefit of, of receiving a FASD diagnosis in the first place. And you obviously touched on lots of benefits for both you know, the individual, their, their family and everything as well. And, um, this question is sort of asking whether sometimes that diagnosis maybe isn't helpful. Um, is there ever any stigma towards the birth mother that you may have experienced or any tips for sort of handling that in a sensitive way, perhaps? I'm happy to answer that. So I think we touched on some of that in the presentation, but overwhelmingly the feedback that we get from carers and also from birth mothers is that it is really helpful for the 
reasons that um, I stated earlier. And we've definitely had young people come through the clinic who um, may have lived in out-of-home care for some time but still have contact with their birth mother. And the birth mother has been supportive of them coming to the clinic for assessment. We've offered also to contact um, birth mothers and that's very much done in a non-blame or you know, non-stigmatising kind of manner, really, to provide information. And I think it's often a relief to know and to understand what the challenges are and how to best help into, and how to best put structures in place for the best outcome for that young person. So that seems to be the overwhelming um, feeling following a diagnosis. Yeah, wonderful. And at the end of the day, that's what's really important as well, that those young people are supported as best as they can be. Um, we yeah. had a, oh, touching, sorry. sorry, just touching on the second part of that question around the DSM or the ICD, um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is not a diagnosis within the DSM, but there is a related diagnosis called neurodevelopmental disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. So they're quite, um, I think the Australian guide is a little bit more specific in the criteria, um, but there is an associate, like the DSM does recognise the impact of prenatal alcohol exposure on neurodevelopment, which is an important factor. Yeah, wonderful. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, so there is a question just around, obviously we've spoken a lot about alcohol and that that is the focus today, but there's a question on whether you're aware of the presentation of the use of other substances during pregnancy and how that might differ or whether you sort of encounter um, young people who might have been exposed to things other than alcohol? I think definitely it's um, an emerging area of research. Um, so far we know that alcohol, um, there's the most evidence that alcohol is the most detrimental um, form of exposure or substance that um, uh, a mother could consume during her pregnancy. Um, but we don't rule out that there are influences of other substances. And many of the mothers that do consume alcohol are polysubstance using during their pregnancy. It's hard to tease apart what is what. Um, but at this stage, I think we know most about how alcohol does impact the developing fetus more than other substances. The one thing I think I would add to that is it does seem to be that there's some interplay between the use of di different substances. So when there has been um, the use where alcohol has been taken and there's also been other drugs, it does seem to be, um, they seem to interplay somehow and there seems to be increased challenges often for the young person. All right. Thank you for answering that. Um, I think we are just about on time. I want to encourage you to have a look at the chat as well because there are lots of people saying thank you for such a wonderful webinar as well. Um, and for anyone whose questions we didn't get to answer today, do feel free to email us um, at info at learningwithfasd.org.au and we'll get back to you um, in any way that we can to try and help. Um, but other than that, just to say a really big thank you to um, Kelly, Lucy and Diana for today. It was a really great session. Um, and you can subscribe to the Learning with FASD um, newsletter or keep in touch with us on socials and um, to hear about our future webinars as well. Thanks very much everyone. Thank you. Bye.